20, then I'll skip down to verse 23. Luke chapter 6. You found it, say amen. Verse 20 says, Then looking up at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, because the kingdom of heaven is yours. Verse 23 says, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Take note, your reward is great in heaven. Because this is the way their ancestors used to treat the prophets. Um, from that verse and those verses I want to talk to you about today, blessed discipleship. Everybody say blessed discipleship. Amen. And look at your neighbor and say, I'm blessed to be a disciple. Amen. You may be seated. Blessed discipleship. It is better to be a blessing than to look for a blessing. Jesus told his disciples it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. The word blessed is defined as fortunate, endowed with divine favor or protection. Many people often say as a cliche, I'm blessed and highly favored. Many people often say, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Amen. Many people say, I'm blessed in the city and I'm blessed in the fields. I'm blessed going out and coming in. Many people say that God is showering down blessings upon me. Many people say that I'm truly blessed. Thank God I'm blessed. Just look at me. I'm blessed. But when we use that word, we must be careful not to overuse the meaning of blessing. Christians often mistake the idea of being blessed with the abundance of material wealth and possessions. Typically, we mean we have clothes, cars, cash, and crib. We got the four C's of blessing without realizing the true Blessing actually means that you have a relationship with God. To be blessed means that you have faith in God. You are one who trusts in God. The first psalm says, Blessed is the man or woman that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on that law they meditate both day and night. Look at the neighbor and say, I know that I'm blessed. Amen. The way that you know you're blessed is not by what you have, but by who has you. When you are aware of the presence of God and know that you are in the hands of God and you are seeking the will of God, that is what it means to be blessed. I'm not blessed because of where I live and what I have. I'm blessed because of the one who gave it to me. I'm preaching today, somebody. I'm blessed because I understand that God has supernatural provisions and his provisions are not based on how good I am or how, excuse me, how good I act. It's because of how good God is to me. We can waste our entire lives looking to acquire things that will be useless for us in the next life. Many people heard the choir sing, the quartet group sing, I never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Heard the old preacher preach a sermon saying we can't take it with us. What is our life just by acquiring material possessions? Touch neighbor and say, neighbor, it's deeper than that. My purpose for preaching to you today is to warn you of the danger of seeking fortune or fame above working out your soul salvation with fear and trembling. Jesus said, what profit a man to gain the whole world than to lose his soul? What sense does it make to build a five billion dollar wall when folks are going to climb over it and folks are going to climb under it? Now, once you get what you think it means to be blessed, and once you get it, you realize that oftentimes it's not what you thought it was. Many people realize that life is more than what you eat and what you wear. 
God did not call us just to look for blessings. Some people come to church looking for a blessing. Some ladies come to church looking for a husband. Some men come to church looking for a wife. But that is not the true reason why God called us here in the house of the Lord today. He called us here not only so that we can receive a blessing from him, but also that we can be a blessing unto others. There's a study that was done that there has been almost a complete 20-year silence about poverty in this country. They said not since about 2002 have scholars and researchers really studied the issue of the poor here in America. For some reasons people believe because America already has an abundance of wealth, so we tend not to look for those who are less fortunate, those who have no food to eat, amen. Those who have no clothes to wear, amen. Those who don't have a roof over their head. We tend to, over the last 20 years or so to have forgotten about the least fortunate. This is why the ministry of the church is so important because Jesus had compassion for the poor. Jesus had a genuine concern for the poor. Not just to have their immediate needs met, but also to look beyond their a physical situation, but also have a desire to see them spiritually made whole. God has already declared, regardless of whether we're poor or rich, because he has spoken a blessing over our lives, he wants us to know that we are truly blessed. And as his disciples, because we are truly blessed, we should strive to be a blessing unto others. Touch your neighbor, say neighbor. I'm here to be a blessing. God is calling us to practice what I call blessed discipleship. In other words, we won't seek to encourage others to become followers of somebody we don't believe in ourselves. We're not going to actively engage in sharing the gospel that we are not living and benefiting from ourselves. It's almost like telling people to go eat at a restaurant where you know the food is nasty. It's almost like telling people to shop at a store where the prices are too high. You're going to use the word of mouth and the power of your message by validating something that you know is good, something that you know is real and something that has benefited you and you know it will benefit somebody else. So if you know God has blessed you, you ought to tell somebody. And if you don't mind telling somebody, they probably will experience him and tell somebody else. That's how the church grows, brothers and sisters. It's when the people of God know that they're blessed, don't mind sharing the blessing, but they also don't mind being a blessing. Blessed discipleship is an attitude that determines our altitude. Blessed discipleship is an attitude of assurance of God's supernatural provision as a response to faith in Jesus Christ. I don't always know what Jesus is up to. Uh, touch neighbor say God is up to something. Uh, and so when God is up to something, he is not just communicating a message to me. Uh, he's communicating also a message to the people around me. Amen. Uh, so when I see my neighbor get blessed, uh, I get excited because I know that there is a blessing on the way. Anybody here that get excited when uh, the U-Haul truck uh, or the delivery truck comes down to your neighbor's house, uh, you know that somebody is moving out, but somebody's also moving in. Uh, and when God is sending a blessing on my street, uh, I get excited because that's a message to me that a blessing is on the way. Uh, and when a blessing is on the way, he's telling me to get ready ready to be a blessing to somebody else. We have so much to be thankful for as disciples of Jesus Christ. God has provided us the gift of eternal life. Somebody say amen. God has provided us the opportunity to share the gospel with others. God has given us the power to teach others how to live according to God's word. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got to share your testimony. 
See, when we share our testimony, it is simply saying that we are giving a, a testament to the fact of how good God has been to us. That's how we be a blessing unto others when we share what the Lord has done for us. And God is not just preparing us to be blessed down here. He's preparing us for our eternal blessing up there and our real true home in heaven. So don't get hooked on your favorite TV shows down here somebody don't get fit, hooked on your favorite clothes and your fancy cars down here because you can't put them on heaven's elevator amen you can't put them on God's escalator touch your neighbor say neighbor you can't take it with you each and every day of our lives we have to live with an attitude that we are blessed. Our outlook and our perspective needs to be big just like our God is big. No problem we face is too big for our God to solve. No, no trouble that we have in our way is going to stop our God because he's so high you can't go over him. He's so low you can't go under him. He's so wide you can't go around them. Uh, that's why Jesus said you must come in at the door. Each step of our spiritual maturity depends on our faithfulness to follow Jesus. How do you really want to follow Jesus? That's how you be a blessed disciple when you're following him in the highs and lows of life. Jesus, my brothers and sisters, will show you and show me and show us along the way the deeper truths of what it means to be blessed. Many people often say, I'm too blessed to be stressed. But they find situations where somebody or something is trying to stress them out. How many of y'all ever have folk uh, that get on your nerves? Tell the truth, somebody. How many of you ever have people when you see them coming, you want to go the other way, somebody? Amen. Now, uh, don't let them stress you out uh, because you just said, I'm too blessed uh, to be stressed. Uh, but when you know that you're blessed, uh, your attitude will determine your altitude. My message to everyone today is that our stress levels will decrease as our faith in God increases. How many of you came here for more faith today? See, when I get more faith, the things that God has already given me, I understand how to be a better steward of what he's given me. Instead of asking him for more stuff, I learned how to take care of the stuff he's already given me. There's a story told about a, a boy that met a wealthy old man, and he asked him, he said, Sir, how did you acquire all of this wealth? He said, that's easy, son. When I was a boy, all I had was an apple, and all I had to eat was an apple, and I would polish that apple every day until it came shiny, and I sold that shiny apple for 10 cents. And then after I sold that apple for 10 cents, I went and bought two more apples, and I shined them real good and I sold them to 32 cents and I kept doing this and I kept doing this during the Great Depression until I finally was able to sell each apple for a dollar and 32 cents and the little boy said with all that sir that's how you became a millionaire he says no my grandfather died and left me two million dollars but I learned how to take care of what I had see some of us we make being blessed look easy but you don't necessarily want the glory until you know the story. We are blessed by God to be a blessing unto others. And in Luke chapter 6, Jesus began his sermon on the plain with a series of blessings and woes to his listeners. Matthew calls this the sermon on the mount. Luke calls this the sermon on the plain. But the teachings are called the Beatitudes. And the reason why they're called the Beatitudes is because your state of being determines not only where your destination, but it also has the 
power to change your situation. See, if I'm depressed in my attitude, my situation is going to be depressed. And my destination is going to be depressed. And all of the energy I detract towards me and attract towards me is going to be depressed people. How many of y'all know misery loves company? How many of you know that trouble is contagious? And so if my attitude is always on a state of being that's negative, generally speaking, my outcome will be negative. But Jesus understood the plight of the people that he was preaching to, and he wanted to place a table before him in the presence of their enemies, the oppressing Roman Empire. And the items that he placed at, at the table before them were two sets of fourfold blessings and fourfold woes that were set as a parallel to each other. The term blessed, my brothers and sisters, was common in the Gospels. It occurred more than 30 times, but all but two occurrences are in Matthew and in Luke. And so these two books, Matthew and Luke, want the disciples to really understand the difference of blessed discipleship and what the enemy called being blessed. See, originally in the Greek, the usage of the word bless uh, it described uh, a happy estate uh, of the gods uh, above uh, the humans that were suffering and later it came to mean that any positive condition that somebody could experience. But unlike the biblical authors, the Greek authors drew happiness in material possessions. That's where it comes from. When people are being secular, they're talking about possessions. But when they're talking sacredly, they're talking about a relationship with God. And so your challenge today, if you're talking about blessings, are you secular or are you sacred? Are you like the world or are you like the people of God? And I don't want to be like the world when I'm talking about being blessed. I want to be like a child of God and say no matter where I am and no matter what I have, if God be for me, he is more than the whole world against me. And so when we ask the question today, how do we share the blessings of God with others? If you know that you're blessed, that means you understand where your blessings come from, but you also understand that you have a mission to be a blessing unto others. The first lesson we learn is, is that we got to seek God in humility. Just make say, seek God in humility. See, if I'm always looking up, I'm going to trip over something. See, what you got to do is you got to learn to walk around with a spirit of humility. This is why Jesus was able to reach people that other people couldn't reach because he had a genuine concern for the poor. He says, blessed are you who are poor. That word poor comes from the word tokos, which means a beggar, one who crouches. It literally means a humble person. And see, some people try to walk around like they big and bad, but they're just as broke as the next man. They, 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 they're keeping up with the Joneses, if you will. They're paying their cable bill on a credit card, amen. They, 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 they're borrowing clothes from belts and from dealers, and they still got the tags tucked on the inside, amen. Now, they're looking good on the outside, but they're broken on the inside. When we're saying seek God in humility, we're saying that you got to be wealthy from the inside out. Jesus is acknowledging something that was the elephant in the room. Many of the people that were following him, they didn't have anything but the clothes on their back. Amen. They didn't even have any food to take with them because we know from the miracle stories that all he had to feed them was a child's lunch. Amen. If they had food for them Themselves, they would have just sat down and had a picnic, y'all. But Jesus recognized the severity of their situation. And some of us use a story about how we were poor, but you at least had some sardines to eat, amen. You at least had some beans to eat from a can. There are some 
folk right here in Greenville uh, who ain't got the clothes on their back uh, or any food on their table. Uh, so we need to be humble in our desire to minister to the poor. Jesus said to them, Blessed are you who poor, because yours is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, Jesus was humbling himself before people that he was trying to reach. And if you want to reach people for God, you got to come off of your high horse, amen, and, uh, and step into somebody else's situation uh, and gain some compassion for what they're going through. Secondly, we got to show a hunger for saving souls. Touch your neighbor say, show a hunger for saving souls. In other words, we are not just invite people to church. We ought to want to see folks saved. My brothers and sisters, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, whether you are have or whether you have not, you need the Lord in your life. Because verse 21 says, Blessed are you who are hungry now, because you will be filled. My brothers and sisters, there's a difference between hungry and hungry. Jesus was not preaching to hungry people. He was preaching to hungry people. And that hunger was a dire hunger, amen. It was a hunger that had a pain to it, amen. It was a hunger where, where many people who haven't eaten in, in two or three days, amen. And so he was appealing to that hunger by telling them that that hunger was a sign that they were still alive. Amen. Because it's a horrible thing to have appetite and no food. But it's a worse thing to have food and no appetite. Let me explain to you, church. There are a lot of folk who are in the church that got food, but they ain't got no appetite. The preaching of the gospel goes forward every Sunday. They ain't got no amens. The choir singing songs of Zion, they ain't got no hallelujah. They can come on in where the table is spread and the feast of the Lord is going on, but they won't eat the food because they ain't got no appetite. God is looking for some people that are hungry for saving souls. Looking for Christ to show up on the inside so he can bring about a change on the outside. That word hungry comes from the word piano, which means to desire earnestly. Yeah. And that's blessed discipleship. Uh, when your earnest desire is not just to pay a bill for somebody, yeah. your desire is to see somebody know Jesus. Uh, when your earnest desire is not just to have somebody uh, just to come in and uh, have a need bit, uh, but when your desire is for them to walk uh, with Jesus. Uh, that's why the old folks used to sing a song that says, uh, while I'm on this tedious journey, yeah, I want Jesus to walk with me. Showing a desire, a hunger for saving souls brings us to the next level of shouting hallelujah in the favor of God. See, once I seek God in humility, once I show a hunger for saving souls, I can shout hallelujah in the favor of God. Whether you know it or not, the favor of God is over your life. Whether you know it or not, you are blessed beyond measure. Whether you know it or not, Jesus is speaking blessings over your life, even right now, as you live and breathe. You see, when I say blessed, uh, I'm not talking about just a cliche. I'm talking about something that, that has already been declared in the Word of God. And as a Christian, because I believe the Word of God, I understand that I now have the power to rejoice in the blessings that have already been spoken over me. And see, that's where we elevate in our faith. And that's where we mature as believers when we understand that by being blessed by God we have the power to speak a blessing because the Bible says life and death is in the power of your tongue and verse 23 sets us up for a moment of celebration because after Jesus speaks four blessings over his followers he says in conclusion that they ought to rejoice in that day and leap for 
joy. That word rejoice comes from the word Cairo, which also means grace and favor. It means that we can be glad. We can offer somebody a greeting in a spirit of joy. See, when I'm rejoicing, I'm going back to something that I already have. Because to rejoice simply means to have joy again. And after you have joy again, my brothers and sisters, then you can leap for joy. Because you know you got something on the inside that's working on the outside that has the power to change the atmosphere. Look at what he says in verse 23. He says, take note, your reward is great in heaven. Old folks used to sing a song that said, I'm working on a building. It's a true foundation. Said, I'm lifting up a bloodstain, banner for the Lord. But they concluded that song that says, when I get through working on this old building, I'm going up to heaven to get my reward. See, my brothers and sisters, I understand now better today than I did on yesterday. When Jesus taught his disciples the Lord's Prayer, he said, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And see, if you don't want to go to heaven, you might as well not start shouting right here. Because when we get up there, it's going to be shouty, howdy, and never goodbye. When we get up there, it's going to be a big party going on. And some folks, I don't believe, my brothers and sisters, really want to go to heaven because when they get into the house of the Lord, they don't know how to celebrate and have a good time. But when I'm here to shout hallelujah, I'm not shouting hallelujah because of some good that I have done. I'm not shouting hallelujah because of how good I am. I'm shouting hallelujah because I've got the favor of God over my life. Just let me say, I'm blessed. Thank God I'm blessed. Jesus spoke four conditions in which people are blessed and happy when they are following him. And as a follower of Christ, you ought to know that you're blessed. You're blessed when you are poor. You're blessed when you're hungry. You're blessed when you're weeping. Because the psalmist said, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You're blessed when uh, people are hating on you uh, and scandalizing your name. Uh, every time I turn around, uh, God keeps on blessing me. Uh, and when you so are hating on you, uh, I just want you to start in front of them uh, and start turning around. Uh, and they're going to look at you like you're crazy. Uh, and you're going to say, uh, the reason why I'm turning around, uh, because every time uh, I turn around, uh, the Lord keeps on blessing me. Uh, and each verse that Jesus is teaching, uh, a person uh, is telling them each other uh, why they're blessed. Uh, a poor person is blessed uh, because uh, his is the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus is followers uh, were physically poor. Uh, some of them didn't have any food to eat. Uh, some of them, all they had uh, was the clothes on their back. Uh, but Jesus is telling us uh, twice and three times, uh, not like Lionel Richie. Uh, I know he said you're once, uh, you're twice, uh, you're three times a lady. Uh, but Jesus is telling his disciples, uh, you're once, uh, you're twice, Twice, uh, you're three times, uh, you're four times blessed. Uh, touch a neighbor say, I'm four times blessed. Uh, I'm blessed going out, uh, and I'm blessed coming in. Uh, I'm blessed when I'm poor. Uh, I'm blessed when I'm hungry. Uh, I'm blessed when people are laughing at me. Uh, and I'm blessed when people are talking about me. Uh, well, the Sister Smith, they said, you can talk about me uh, as much as you please. The more you talk, I'm going to stay on my knees. I can stay on my knees because I know that I'm blessed. I'm blessed because not what I have, but I'm blessed because of who has me. That's how you can stand on your feet today because you know that through it all, 
you're in the hands of God. I'm blessed to be in his hands. That's a good place to shout right there. I can shout hallelujah because I know through it all, I'm in the hands of God. I got to get out of here. But some of y'all came to church today not looking to be a blessing. You came looking for a blessing. I came to tell you a story. That's a story about a man whose name was Dan. Dan attended the reading of the will after his cousin Charles had died. His cousin Charles was rich. His cousin Charles had money, y'all. And Dan was going to the wheel reading. He was looking for a blessing. And then the lawyer was reading the wheel. He read it to all the people that were mentioned in the wheel. He said, to you, my loving wife, Rose, who stood that I need in rough times and in the tough times, in good times, as well as bad times, I'm going to leave you the house and two million dollars. The lawyer kept on reading. He said to my daughter, Jessica, you look after me in sickness and in health. You kept the business going. He said, I'm going to leave you the yacht. I'm going to leave you the business. And I'm going to give you a million dollars. And by this time, Cousin Dan was sitting on the edge of his seat. He saw that the wife had got two million. He saw that the daughter had gotten one million. He figured at least he was going to get 500000 The lawyer concluded to my cousin Dan, who hated me, who talked about me, who argued with me, and thought I would never amount to anything. You probably thought I would never mention you in my wheel. Well, you got it all wrong. I just want to say to you, hey, Dan, God bless you. And that's what I'm here to tell some of you. What some of you want to know, if you're in your cousin's wheel, if you're in your father's wheel, if you're in your brother's wheel, or your sister's wheel, what you need to make sure that you're in God's wheel. Because when I'm in his wheel, I ain't got to look for nobody to give me anything. Because I'm in his hands, I know that I'm blessed. Just shake your neighbor's head and say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Going out, I'm blessed. Coming in, I'm blessed. Because I'm in his hands. God's got it all in his hands. If you know that you're blessed, shout hallelujah. And say, thank God. I'm blessed. Say yeah, say yeah, say yeah. I know I'm blessed. I know I'm blessed. I thank God I'm blessed. Jesus blessed his disciples. He laid his hands on them and he blessed them. He prayed for them and he blessed them. He laid hands on them. And he blessed them. And if he laid his hands on you, will you stand to your feet and say hallelujah anyhow? Because he got his hands on you. I don't care if they talk about you. I don't care if they scandalize your name. If you know that you're blessed, you can make a disciple. If you know that you're blessed, you can give somebody a word. If you know that you're blessed, you can just be a blessing. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, may not look good right now, but thank God that I know the goodness of Jesus. How do I know? Because the song said, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, and all he does for me, my soul cries hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. I know I'm blessed because I'm saved. And as long as I'm saved, I can shout, I can sing, I can say thank you, Jesus.
Shake a neighbor's hand and say, neighbor.